Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, my pleasure to introduce Grant McLean. He's a developer here in Wellington at Catalyst. He also runs the WhatsApp user group. Uh, so Grant is going to tell us about a project of his. Uh, Stoke Exchange. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you. Right. Seems like this microphone works, so that's all good. Um, my name's Grant. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a project I've been working on recently. Um, I'm going to describe the problem I was trying to solve, um, a bit of detail about how I went about solving it. Um, spoiler alert, that involves SVG, so then I'm going to delve into what SVG is, um, why it's suitable for the sort of thing I was doing with it, and um, how you might use it um, if you wanted to try that yourself, and then wrap up with some of the pros and cons. Where this technology uh, shines and where it might not be suitable, um, and we may have time for Q&A if we don't hit me up in, in the breaks and in the hallway. I'm happy to ask questions, answer questions, sorry. Um, so, the world has a lot of Sudoku websites. Why did I think we needed another one? Um, this one here, for example, uh, websudoku.com, I've spent many happy hours on the site solving Sudokus, um, but it's, n it's quite clunky, um, the user interface, um, it's not terribly user-friendly, um, and a cynical person might observe that it really only exists as a way to deliver ads, um, that, and the ads are quite intrusive, they're, they're cycling through as fast as the ad API will allow, so they're constantly flashing and animating, and uh, I actually um, blocked them anyway, but when I went there to take the screenshot, I thought it was amusing the ad was for an ad blocker. Um, <laughs> in, anyway, um, one of the good things about the ads is that Google knew that I like Sudoku, so one day, uh, when I went to YouTube, the YouTube algorithm introduced me to these guys. Now, hands up who's, who's heard of them, watched any of the videos. Oh, I'm pleased to see there's a few of you out there. So the, the channel is called Cracking the Cryptic, um, or CTC, and you would subscribe to this channel if you wanted to watch a couple of middle-aged English chaps solve Sudoku. <laughs> which I admit sounds dire, but it's actually really compelling. Um, they, they explain what they're doing every step along the way, so you can really level up your Sudoku skills. Um, but another aspect of it that people have observed is that watching them systematically bring order out of chaos is a really good stress relief um, for people in some of the situations that Laura was describing this morning. Um, so anyway, the way it works is you go to this site, uh, you, you go to the video, there'll be a link under the video to that puzzle in their app. So they've got this app. Um, and one of the unique features about um, the app is because they only solve hard Sudoku, they need um, the ability to make notes and record things they've learned along the way. And I'm not sure how much you can make out on the screen if you back. But these two cells here, you can see, have each have a five and an eight penciled in the middle. And, and that indicates that no other digits are possible in either of those cells because they've all been eliminated because they appear in the column, the row, or the box. Um, so that's the numbers in the middle. But if we look up in this box here, you can see we couldn't have a four in the top row because there's one further over. We couldn't have a four in the last column because there's one further down. So this, these little blue fours here indicate the only two places where a four could go in this three by three box. So whereas the numbers in the middle tell you something about the cell, the numbers in the corners tell you something about that three by three box. Now, there's two reasons why that's useful. Um, if you were looking at this box over here, you might naively think, well, there are three places a four could go. Um, not the top row, but there's three boxes down here. But now we know there's only two places a four could go here. Either of them would eliminate fours from here, so there's actually only one place a four can go. And if we put it in, then 
look down here where we've pencil marked two places where a four could go, we've just eliminated one, we don't have to rethink it, we can just mark this as a four. So this dual pencil marking or notation system was a key thing that I learned about and came to like, but, um, oh, before I go into that, sorry, um, if you go to this site now, um, you'll see that they do a lot of variant Sudokus. So the standard rules plus some additional constraints. So here we've got some cells with grey circles have to have an odd number, grey squares have to have an even number. Uh, this one involves a bit of arithmetic where you're adding up the digits on the line and putting the sum in that uh, yellow circle in the centre. Um, by adding the extra constraints, it allows them to start with fewer given digits. And in fact, it's really common to have puzzles like this that have no given digits at the start at all, and yet still have a unique solution. And it's fascinating to watch it unfold. So the problem I had is I was using their app, and I liked the dual pencil marking thing, but at best, I was getting one puzzle a day. Um, and I needed the practice on the classic Sudokus. Um, so I, I couldn't use other apps in the same way because they didn't support two types of pencil marking, and I couldn't put different puzzles in their app because it didn't have a UI for entering a puzzle. Um, so what I wanted was a superior web app with this list of um, features, um, and I'll warn you now, I'm pushing the bounds of what I can fit on one screen with these slides. Um, but I wanted it keystroke compatible, two types of pencil marking, undo, read it, all that you can read. Um, importantly, I wanted to be able to share a puzzle um, as a link. So if you found one in a magazine or, or a newspaper and you wanted to enter it into the site and solve it online rather than with pencil and paper, then you could share that with friends and family. So, you can go to the site I built now, it's called, well not now, uh, it's called sudokuexchange.com, it's free, it has no ads, and it's open source so you can download the code off GitHub and help me make it better. Um, it looks like this, when you come to the site there's a bunch of pre-built Sudoku puzzles there that update every hour, so it's always fresh, um, and the, you can enter a new puzzle if you've got one that you want to put in the software. Um, the UI looks very similar to theirs. Um, it has the two types of pencil marking. It's got some cell highlighting and colouring and all that good stuff. It also has a dark mode, which their app didn't have and was a highly requested feature. Um, it has a bunch of settings, so you can turn off the things you don't like. For example, the timer ticking away in the top corner can be quite intimidating, um, or you can turn on features you do like. Um, when you've got a puzzle loaded, there's a menu with all sorts of other things you can do with the puzzle, um, including sharing it with friends and family. So, I mentioned that I built the site using SVG. What is SVG? Uh, it's right there in the name. It's an image format that scales. So, you can use it in a traditional sense with, with a GUI editor like Inkscape or Illustrator where you edit your image, save it in a file, and then load it using a normal HTML image tag. That works. Um, here's an example of doing that. Um, I've got an SVG on the left and a PNG on the right. Um, and the difference becomes apparent when I change the um, width associated with that tag, and you'll notice that the PNG one becomes really blurry because it, the image was defined as a little matrix of pixels and it was quite a small image and now it's been stretched to cover a wider area. So the browser had to make stuff up. Whereas the one on the left, the SVG, is defined using shapes that um, are laid out on a coordinate system and those shapes can be scaled um, using simple math that the browser does for you. So a really common way of using SVG is for icons on buttons, for example. And I've done that in my UI. Um, up the top, there's a bunch of buttons that have SVG icons. But I've taken it 
to a different level, these two complex UI elements in the middle of the, of the page are each an SVG image that is dynamically created and altered as, as you work your way through the puzzle. Um, one of the things that this allows me to do is adapt the UI to whatever screen size is available. So if someone's got a big screen, obviously I can scale it up. But if they've got a portrait mode screen, I can rearrange those elements. Um, and one a subtle feature you might not have noticed is back here, I've got five rows of buttons, um, including these ones at the top, because I've got lots of vertical space. But when I switch to this mode, I've rearranged the buttons because I've got less vertical space and I want the buttons to be as big as they can be uh, because that's important on touch. Um, so a possibly surprising thing about SVG is although it's an image format, it's text. So you can edit SVG images in Vim, for example. Um, it uses um, a syntax very similar to HTML um, with elements defined with start tags and end tags, um, elements inside other elements, all that good stuff. SVG images don't really have a height and a width as such. The shapes are laid out on this um, coordinate system that effectively stretches in, in infinite uh, distances in, in both directions. So what it has instead is this thing called a view box, which is a rectangular area defined by um, the uh, x, y coordinates of the top left corner and the bottom right corner. And any shape that's defined that's inside or partially inside that view box will be visible, and anything that's outside there won't be visible. And then this view box is communicated to the browser, and it sizes the image, maintaining those proportions within the space available. So um, an SVG image or document um, will use SVG as the outer element. Um, it'll define a view box, and it'll probably have this namespace declaration, uh, which I'm going to omit from uh, all the rest of the examples. Now, that actually is a valid SVG image. Um, this is it shown at the bottom. I've used CSS to put a box shadow on there so that you can see it. If I now put some other elements inside there, here's a rectangle, um, and I've got uh, x and y coordinates to position it and height and width to size it, um, and I've set a fill colour there. I could change the fill colour um, and put a stroke colour for the border around the outside of that shape um, and set the width. I could add another shape, um, in this case an ellipse, um, which once again has coordinates to position it and dimensions to size it. Um, and I could um, add in a text element, which um, in this case is overlaid. And that's an important concept, that each element that you add one after the other, the ones you add first are in the back, the ones you add later are in the front. There are a bunch of other um, elements you can use in, in your graphics. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this one, but it's for drawing complex shapes where you draw lines uh, in a path and they can be straight or curved. Um, you can close the path and you can fill it with colour and all that good stuff. Now, I mentioned you can use an image tag um, in HTML. Another way to use it is you could use an object tag to embed it that has certain advantages, but I'm not going to go into that because what I'm doing is just putting the SVG tags directly in the HTML. In HTML5, that's a valid thing to do. You just drop them straight in. Um, so here, for example, is uh, a div with an ID. I've got um, an SVG with some rectangles in it. Um, and that's them displayed below. And because those are now part of the DOM, I can use that ID tag, I can use the element names, and I can um, provide CSS that overrides the fill colour that was in the element um, and puts a different fill colour here. And better yet, it responds to um, the hover selector. So I've got 
an image that is responding to my interactions. And I can take that a step further and put a um, click event handler in there. Um, and when it fires, I can change a class name on the um, rectangle element and the CSS will change the way that it's presented based on the presence of that class name. Now, you can generate SVG with back-end languages or front-end. I chose to use React. Um, and a short worked example, if I wanted to create this diagram using um, React and SVG, um, I could start with um, rendering the diagram component. And now let's look at defining that component. Uh, initially, all I've done is uh, used the props to set some default dimensions and then defined a class that I'm going to put on the, the container element because I want to mess with that class later. Um, I've used those dimensions to build up the view box um, coordinates. I've built an SVG container element with the class in the view box. So now this is actually a, a valid component that returns something. Um, and now I just need to fill it up. I put a rectangle element in there that covers the whole uh, view box and is going to be used for a background. If I didn't put that in, the background would be transparent, which is quite useful in some cases, not what I wanted here. And then finally, I've added three calls to a text box component, which is going to draw a box and put some text in it. It's not actually in it, it's overlaid. It looks like it's in it. So that component, the text box component, um, Starts with this. Once again, some props to set up some defaults. Um, this time I'm using a G element um, for my container. So that's for grouping elements together so that I can do things with them as a group. Um, I add our old friend the rectangle um, and a text element and we're almost done. Now, the observant amongst you will notice that I'm putting this at coordinate zero, 00, up in the top left corner of my diagram. And so all three of these text boxes will overlay each other in that top left corner. Uh, and I'm not yet using the X and Y uh, parameters or properties. Instead, what I've done here is I've used them to build up a transformation, um, in this case, a translate. Um, which I've then applied using the transform attribute on the G element. So that moves everything in there to the X and Y position that was passed in. And it allows you to simplify. You don't have to do the maths to calculate uh, where things should start and end based on uh, where they were positioned. You can just assume they're all at the beginning and then move them or rotate them or skew them. There's all sorts of things you can do with the transform. Um, so then um, I've defined some colors in my CSS using um, CSS custom variables. I've applied those colors to elements using selectors that um, use classes and use SVG element names, um, set the fill color for the box um, and the text. So there's, there's our result. Now, what if I wanted to take it a step further and have a diagram that when you clicked on the background, it toggled between dark mode and light mode? Um, in real life, you'd have a, a button or a widget or something rather than clicking on the background, but this is just a simple example. So if we start with exactly what we had before for that diagram component, um, we need some state. So I pull in use state um, and have a Boolean to indicate whether I'm currently in dark mode or not. The next line, the classes line, I now expand that to add the class dark if we are in dark mode. Um, and finally, I have an on-click handler on that background element that will toggle the Boolean. And that 
is all I need to change in the code, uh, in the CSS, I've got these existing colours, I just need to add another set of colours with a more specific selector um, that will be applied if the class is applied. And job done. So, Jesus. Um, to review, SVG um, elements can just go in your HTML. Um, there are advantages sometimes to having them in separate files, but equally there can be advantages to them just being in components um, in, in your front-end um, workflow. Um, you can use React or Vue or Angular or anything to dynamically generate them. Um, and as a rule, I would suggest that you don't use the fill and stroke attributes on the elements themselves. Leave all that presentation stuff up to CSS. Um, you can use on-click um, event handlers on those elements to respond to things. Um, and similarly for touch events as well. Um, and I'd recommend adding and removing classes um, when you want to vary the, the styles that are applied to those elements. Um, I mentioned that the order that elements appear in the DOM affects the layering, what's in front of, of what else. Um, the, you can't use Z order in CSS to affect that um, for SVG elements. Um, if you've got a UI that needs paragraph text where it wraps within a space, um, that's going to be challenging to achieve with SVG. Um, it's possible, but um, you might be better off just using HTML for that bit. Um, in my app, I'm using mouse, touch, and, and keyboard events, and, and that works fine, but if you want text input, then that would be quite a bit harder. An HTML text input element gives you a lot of stuff for free. Um, you know, for example, cut and paste, you just get it. Whereas if you were implementing your whole UI using just SVG, you'd have to re-implement all of that yourself. Um, one approach you could use um, that, that I've employed is um, in the few cases where I do need text input, I have a modal that appears above the SVG. Um, it's just in, in the HTML, and that uses standard HTML text input elements. Um, elephant in the room here is probably accessibility. Um, if you were to say to me, Grant, does your uh, Sudoku app work with a screen reader? The answer would be not even close, I'm afraid. But there's more to accessibility than screen readers, um, and you would need to assess this um, for your app. In my case, the fact that I could easily add a dark mode made the app more accessible to um, kids. Um, speaking as an old person who prefers a white background, um, the, the fact that it automatically scales to be as big as the screen will allow made it more accessible to people with visual impairments. The fact that it, has, uh, it accepts mouse and touch and keyboard events makes it accessible to people who perhaps lack fine motor skills. So um, as with all things accessibility related, um, there's a bit of a continuum and it doesn't matter where you are, there's always more you could do. In my case, there's much more I could do. Um, if you want to get into this stuff, um, by all means, uh, look at my code. Um, and as I mentioned, help me make it better. Um, there's an SVG tutorial on MDN, um, which um, is uh, a, a good introduction. Um, Sam Muir here, is Sam in the room? No, he's a local, local chap. Um, he's done a, a very cool um, tutorial on um, introducing pictures and animation um, with SVG. So that's another good place to start. Um, and perversely, one of the things that um, often people struggle with with SVG is getting the image to scale. Um, sometimes people find they're in a situation where uh, the, the, the borders of it 
scale, but the image is just the same, maybe up hard up against the left or whatever. So there's a really good article on cssstricks.com that explains all the things you have to get right, um, and the key one is really just that view box thing. Um, so that's all I had uh, prepared. Um, we have got time for questions, so thanks. Awesome, thanks Grant. Uh, we've got questions? Uh, firstly, thank you, that was really clear, uh, and I, I learned a lot. Um, so I'm curious whether you started this project with SVG in mind, or whether you went down like a span and a div type, type track and went, ah, this isn't going to work, and then went to SVG that way? Yeah. Um, the answer is yes, I did start it with SVG in mind. I, um, I wanted the tool, um, but also I, I wanted to learn more about SVG. Um, and I had, had picked apart some of the other UIs that were out there and, and saw some of the heinous things that they were doing with, with HTML and thought, I don't want to do that. Um, it, it is always challenging when you're doing um, a, a sort of project in your own time to learn stuff. You want to pick something that is worth doing, otherwise you won't be motivated to finish it. But that can also mean that you really want to get it done, so you stick with the stuff you tried and true that you know. In this case, I, I did try and push the boat out a bit there. First of all, uh, thank you. It was a great uh, presentation. Um, so I'm not sure if you know any other languages, like for example, JavaScript or maybe mobile app development languages. I know Perl. Yeah. yeah. So, how <laughs> <laughs> so how would you compare the development time, SVG versus you know, other languages or scripts languages? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, it's a very different area that you're working in. Um, the things that you're doing with SVG um, would, would be much harder to do with just HTML, for example. So it, in some ways, you need to compare it to working with image formats um, like PNG or, or, um, or JPEG. Um, but one of the things that, that people do with it um, is drawing charts and graphs and things for which there are some good libraries out there. Um, and I think it compares very well in terms of development time there. Although some of those libraries, you actually don't need to care what's going on under the covers, but you can get very good results um, with relatively little effort. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Oh, way over there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit of. <laughs> I thought I was going to go overtime. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, also, as, a, as a, another old bloke, I quite like dark mode. So, uh, <laughs> what's the performance like of SVG versus just drawing straight on the canvas? Um, I've never never worked with the canvas, um, so. I, I can't directly answer that. Um, and really all I can say about performance is it hasn't hurt me yet. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> what are the key benefits of using SVGs in the first place? Like, would, would you recommend like, building more apps with SVGs in the future? Uh, I, I definitely would, but bearing in mind um, questions about accessibility. Um, it's, it's good for... Um, you know, game type things, um, but if if you were you know building a, a website that that you needed your customers to be able to use, then you would seriously have to look at the accessibility angle on there. Um, yeah. What what were what were some of the things that you that made that like SVG a good choice for a Sudoku puzzle and not just like HTML with divs? Well, <laughs> SVG's made, uh, sorry, Sudoku is made for being um, rendered with SVG because it is a grid um, and you want to put numbers in specific places and you want to draw boxes around them and, and SVG just fits that box, as it were. Yeah. Another question? 
Oh, one over here. <laughs> Shall we call this the last one? <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, you know, on, on further pushing the boat, what about sort of like WebGL? Like how would that compare with SVG? Yes, good question. I mean, the key area where that is going to be a big win over SVG is, is 3D. Um, the SVG is, is targeting 2D um, drawings. So um, 3D and, and rendered 3D with textures and things are, are definitely going to be much easier and, and get better results with, with um, OpenGL, WebGL technology. Thank you very much, Grant. Uh, this is the end of the talk until lunch. Uh, so you've got go off, grab lunch, uh, and back here at 1.45 for the next track of talks. Thanks again to Grant. Thank you.